kids, they would, you know, use these kids and they would put them in the room and they would give them a marshmallow or a cookie and essentially they would tell them, you can have that right now if you want it. But if you wait until I get back, you can have two. And then, of course, they would leave the room for about 15, 20 minutes or whatever, and they were videotaping it, and they were trying to uh, uh, do a study on delayed gratification. You know, there is something about food that is just wonderful. We love food. Does anybody in here not love food? I didn't think so. We love food. I love food. I love tacos so much. You know, I find it very ironic as we're going through the seven deadly sins and we're preaching through these. And last week we preached about lust and it did not even occur to me that on the Sunday that the women's ministry are making everybody a huge breakfast, we're going to preach about gluttony. <laughs> but you know, sometimes when people come to God, they, they, they have all these issues because they think that if they come to God, it means that I'm not going to be allowed to do certain things. They ask the question, you know, if I become a Christian, what do I have to give up? What do I have to stop doing? Because if, you know, if you're a Christian, you can't do anything. You know, because somehow they believe that God does not want us to have any fun or any joy. That he's just a God of no's. And that he's sitting up in heaven saying, nope, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't have this. Uh, wipe that smile off your face. Pick up your cross and follow me. There's no joy serving God. And that's just simply not true. God wants us to have joy. And he wants us to enjoy things. He just wants us to enjoy them the right way. And we need the ability to say no. Otherwise, we are unable to enjoy things the right way. And we become a slave to them. And so I want to talk to you this morning about the sin of gluttony out of Proverbs 23, starting in verse 19. Solomon says here, listen, my son, and be wise and direct your heart in the way. Do not be heavy with drinkers of wine or with gluttoners, or gluttonous eaters of meat, for the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe one with Rags. So let's first of all look at identifying gluttony. Gluttony is generally defined, if we were to put a definition by it, as excessive eating. And I don't think that's an incorrect definition at all. However, when we look at it through the Bible, it is very often mentioned alongside drunkenness, laziness, and poverty. See, gluttony and drunkenness are a primary driver that leads to laziness and poverty. What we're really talking about here is excess. In many different things, we're talking about overindulgence. We're talking about an unsatisfiable appetite. Paul says in Philippians 3.18, many live as enemies of the cross. And he goes on to say their end is destruction and their God is their stomach. They're always trying to satisfy their desires. Gluttony is not about what we do on Thanksgiving Day. Gluttony is not what many of us did this morning. Gluttony is not about uh, every once in a while you have a second helping or, man, that was so good and you overeat and now I feel terrible. That's not what we are talking about here. In the Bible, this is associated with a continual over and over spiritual issue. Now, I want to go off on a rabbit trail for just a moment. We're going to take a sidetrack because I want to make sure that I clarify something. This is not a message about being overweight. Now, we might be overweight because we do struggle with this issue. Absolutely. 
But this is not necessarily the primary root or issue with every single person that struggles with weight. Absolutely not. We can struggle with weight because of genetics, because of illness, because of disorders, because of physical limitations, and all sorts of other things. A central issue in our country is that the food system in this country is financially driven and absolutely corrupt. I know, I won't go on this tangent too long, but let me tell you something. Do some research on how bad sugar is for the human body. Then go to the grocery store and try to buy products that are not drowned in it. I read one article that said your ketchup addiction is actually a sugar addiction. You cannot buy anything that is not drowned in it. You cannot buy anything that is not processed and full of chemicals that are horrible to the human body. The reality is the food system in our country is broken. It is filled with products that are meant to drive their costs down and their profit up, and they do not care uh, about citizens or their health at all. So if you think the FDA is making sure that all of our products are safe and good and healthy, you're living in a dream world. We are busy working families that are trapped in a very broken system. And I just want to I want to clarify that, okay? But however, when we do look at gluttony When we look at it in its most basic form, it is the inability to say no to our flesh. Regardless of whether we're talking about sinful things, whether we're talking about bad things, or even if we're talking about good things. Sometimes we're unable to say no to the right things or the good things, but at the wrong time. We find ourselves binging when we're not even hungry. We find ourselves watching Netflix at 3 o'clock in the morning because we just can't say no to one more episode. Nobody's guilty of that but me. Okay, thank you. It's rare that I find something I like, but then when I find something, it's like, oh, I got to know what happens next. Just one more. We overindulge on anything that makes us feel good. Let's look secondly at exposing gluttony. See, this happens to be one of those sins that, let's be honest, it is super uncomfortable to talk about. We don't like to talk about it. We want to ignore it. It, It's just we want to put that one out of of, of our, our focus. We're very quick and easy to label other things as sin, but we ignore this one. And ignoring it may keep us from being offended. It may keep us from being hurt, but but the issue doesn't go away. Look at Proverbs 13, 24. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. And then in verse 25, Solomon says, The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the stomach of the wicked is in need. Now, I think it's very interesting that Solomon puts those two verses right next to each other. See, we don't like to discipline our children. Nobody enjoys disciplining their kids, but we understand the necessity of it. If we truly love our children, if we truly care about their welfare and their future, we are going to correct their behavior. We are going to make them learn how to sit down and shut their mouth. Why? Because we love them. We understand that if we do not do that, if we do not correct their behavior, then when they grow up, their lives are going to end in destruction. And then right next to that scripture, Solomon begins to talk about our appetite. And that's very interesting. And he compares it to those that are righteous and those that are wicked. 
See, if we are unable to discipline our appetite, it is going to lead to destruction. If we care about ourselves, if we care about our health, we will discipline our appetite. Now, there are two sides to this that we want to address. There is the physical side and there is the spiritual side. So let's first of all look at the spiritual side. The reality is it's unhealthy. When we binge on things that are destroying our body, Solomon says again in Proverbs 25, 27, it is not good to eat too much honey. In other words, sugar and sweets and junk. People don't understand. The Bible clarifies everything. The Bible knew how bad that was before science did. And he says, nor is it glory to search out one's own glory. And then he says, like a city that is broken into without walls is a man who has no control over his own spirit. Physically, it's unhealthy. I read an article that said not long ago, type 2 diabetes was practically unheard of in people under 30. Hence, its former name, adult onset diabetes. But type 2 diabetes isn't just for adults anymore. The number of children and adolescents with the condition has skyrocketed over the last 20 years and is still climbing, prompting e experts to call it an epidemic. They can't figure it out. Yes, they can, and they know the answer, but they're paid a, a lot of money for the doctors that talk about it to not talk about the sugar epidemic in our country. The products that our children are eating are drowned in sugar. There is a reason when you look at your food labels, it tells you how many grams of sugar, but will not tell you the percentage of daily allowance. It has been lobbied and removed because one Coca-Cola would, would exceed three times the amount you should have in a day. But they won't talk about it because they do not care about our physical health. Another article said decades ago, the global epidemic of type 2 diabetes was predicted by epidemiologists, I don't even know what that is, but it's smart people, who observed large and rapping increases in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes, listen to this, among indigenous people who adopted Western diets and lifestyles. In other words... And I've, I've seen footage of this. In other words, these countries that were isolated from modern diets and modern technologies and they were just living off of the land, these, these were extremely healthy people. And now they've watched as Western diets have come into these nations and they, the diseases, the sicknesses, the illnesses, and the diabetes has skyrocketed. Do you not see the connection? It did not exist until they began adopting American diets. Why? Well, because these American companies don't care about them, and I know I'm on a soapbox on that, but they look at these people and they see another area of market share, and they do not care. You and I must care about our physical health. God cares about our physical health. When we look at the Old Testament and we look at the children of Israel, God gave the children of Israel some pretty extensive dietary restrictions, right? You go through the book of Leviticus and what you can eat and what you cannot eat and what you should not touch and this and that and the other. It, these are very extensive and some pretty strict dietary laws that he gave to the children of Israel. And this was not because he did not want them to enjoy things. Not at all. You're only allowed to eat rice cakes and salad. Don't put bacon on that salad. You know... That's not what this was about. God cared about their physical health. Today we are not under the law. Thank God we live under grace. 
We're not under the law, and we can eat as much bacon as we want. Can I get a hallelujah? Yes. I love bacon. Right? I love donuts. We don't live by those restrictions. However, we still need to bring our body under subjection to our spirit. We still need to discipline ourselves and live a healthy lifestyle. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. God dwells in here. Secondly, there is the spiritual side of this. And I think that there is a spiritual element of this that we cannot overlook. For many people, food has become a way to deal with emotional problems in their life. Food has become a comfort or an escape for depression, anxiety, vulnerability, and a lot of other issues. And for whatever reason, they find comfort in that. It makes them feel better. A psychologist named Dr. Sharam Hashmet made a statement and he said, there seems to be a consistent connection between negative emotions and unhealthy foods. In a bad mood, people are drawn to sugary and fatty foods as a coping mechanism. These foods are typically energy-dense, high-fat, and sweet, and they give distinctive pleasures that make us temporarily feel better. And they do. They do. When, when we are depressed, man, there is nothing better than a big thing of ice cream that just, man, I just feel better. Until like an hour later, and then you're like, ugh. In Genesis 25, there's a story that takes place between a man named Jacob and a man named Esau. And so Esau is the firstborn. And because he is the firstborn, there are certain rights and privileges that have been allotted to him. And one of those is that he has this great inheritance that is going to come from his father. This great promise of land and riches and joy and all all of these things that have been promised to him for his father. And one day, Esau is out hunting. And Esau is a great hunter, and he's out in the field, and he's hunting. And he comes home, and apparently it was not a good day hunting because he comes home empty. And his brother is there, and his brother is making a stew. And Esau goes up to him, and he begins to ask him for some of the stew. And Jacob says to him, he says, I'll trade you. I will give you the stew, but you give me your birthright. You give me what is promised to you from our father, and I will give you the soup. Esau gave away his birthright. Esau gave away the promise of this father for a temporary satisfaction, for something that was just going to temporarily make him feel better. He gave away his future promise. Poole said that Esau went his way despising his birthright. Now think about that. He hated his birthright. He despised his birthright, preferring the present and momentary satisfaction of his lust and appetite before God's and his Father's blessing and all the glorious privileges of the birthright. Now, when you think about that story, it seems so ridiculous. What is wrong with this man? But as I began to study for this sermon and put these things together, I really believe that God quickened that story to my heart. Because when you look at this, there had to be something emotionally wrong, something mentally deep inside of Esau 
that he despised his birthright and was able to give it away for such a temporary fleeting feeling. See, many times food has become that crutch that helps us deal with these things in our life. And we run to it as a way to make the feelings go away and to feel better. A drug addict does the exact same thing. There is something wrong with Esau. He was driven to that momentary happiness. And he lost all of the glorious promises of his father. Bishop Hall said there was never any meat except the forbidden fruit so dear bought as the broth of Jacob. Let's look lastly at dealing with gluttony. Just like any other sin, this can disqualify us from being able to fulfill God's will in our life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.27, he says, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. When we are unhealthy, we can, and I'm not saying that we will, but we can put ourselves in a situation where we are physically unable to enjoy our lives, where we are physically unable to enjoy our families and our children. We are physically unable to do the things for God that we would like to do. What we must learn to bring into our lives is temperance. Temperance is defined as moderation in action, thought, or feeling. It is, a, it is excuse me, an habitual moderation in the indulgence of the appetites or passion. Moderation in or abstinence from the use of alcoholic beverages. See, where joy can cure anger. See, where patience can cure irritability. Temperance can cure gluttony. It brings our physical body into submission to our spiritual body. How many of you enjoy fasting? Can I get an amen? I didn't think so. There is nothing more miserable than fasting. I hate it. But you know what it does? It is my spiritual body telling my physical body, no. I am not controlled by my desires. I am not controlled by my appetites. I am not controlled by my flesh. I am more than just a person who goes through physical things. I am a spiritual person, and I am able to bring that into submission. And it's miserable. Proverbs 23.1, when you sit down to dine with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you. And I'm going to switch this. And if you are a man of great appetite, in other words, if you are someone that struggles with this, Solomon says, put a knife to your throat. Okay, now, he doesn't mean that literally, right? This is a metaphor that he's placing in here. In other words, what he's saying is, when you go to feast, when you go to uh, die, if you know that you struggle in this area, Solomon says, restrain yourself as if your life depended on it. Because it could. Maybe not a one-time instance, but over and over and over and over and over again, we know that an alcoholic is killing themselves. Over and over and over and over again, we know that a drug addict is killing themselves. And the reality is, when you look at the food system in our country, 
the chemicals and the sugar and all of these things. And when we binge on these things over and over and over and over and over and over again, over years and years and years, it brings temporary satisfaction for a time, but we're killing ourselves. I want to close this morning, if our musicians could come up. I think most of us want to honor God, right? Most of us want to honor God, not just in one thing or a handful of things, but we want to honor God in everything that we do. In all things, we want to honor God. And that also includes our physical body. It is the temple where the Spirit of God dwells. And people who do not struggle in this area may completely underestimate how difficult this can be for some people. There is nothing worse than people that are just like, oh, well, just change your diet, start exercising, and then life will be worth it. Blah, 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 blah. Oh. People that don't struggle in this area do not understand how difficult that it can be. I will admit to you that I struggle in this area. Junk food, man. Late at night, I just craving that sugar. And I know that it's bad for me. And I know that I look in the mirror and I say, man, you need to start eating healthier. You need to start doing this and doing that. And, and, and I tell myself, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm starting it, I'm doing it, and I'm doing it. And it's just my flesh, man. I want that so bad. People that do not struggle with this don't understand how difficult it can be. But you know who does understand how difficult it is? And that's Jesus. Jesus was tempted in every single way that you and I have ever been tempted. Look at what the book of Hebrews says. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet is without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in, uh, to help us in our time of need. Jesus understands our struggles. He understands our weaknesses. He wants to help us. This is a very difficult sermon for me to put together and preach because you're so fearful that people are going to take it the wrong way. This is not about what you think it's about. This is about bringing our physical body under subjection to our spiritual body. That I am not controlled by my flesh, I am controlled by my spirit. And if this is an area in your life that you struggle with, I want to tell you something, there is hope. It may not be easy, in fact, it may be extremely difficult, but God can help you. This is not, you know, God wants you to be uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and have a six-pack, and God wants you to, you know, th th there are people that, 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 that take that so far in the wrong direction, and everything in their life is about being in the gym and eating celery and having this and that and this. That, that's not what God wants. God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be able to live your life and enjoy the long life that He wants to give you. He wants you to be able to enjoy your children and your grandchildren. I was just with my daughter. We had to go on a long car trip the, uh, Friday and Saturday and, uh, to, to a wedding. And it was so wonderful to have my oldest daughter locked in a car for that many hours and I could just preach at her and talk to her. It was awesome. And we were talking. And I don't know why, but I said, you know what? I'm going to be an awesome grandpa. You know, I mean, you know, she doesn't even have a boyfriend, you know. 
and, I, and she doesn't need one until she's 36, right? But I was like, man, I'm going to be an awesome grandpa. Man, I'm going to be out there playing ball and teaching them this and teaching them that and this and that and the other. And, and that's the first time I ever really thought of myself in that way. And it actually really made me smile, you know? And it's like, you know what? I, I need to take better care of myself, God. I, I want to enjoy my life and enjoy my children and my grandchildren. And I was like, you know what, God? You got to help me with that. Because I'm terrible. God will help us, though. Look at Exodus 23, 25. It says, but you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, therefore, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? God wants us to be healthy. God wants us to be able to do His will. He wants us to be able to enjoy our lives and enjoy our children and our grandchildren. If you struggle in that area this morning, when we, when we pray, I want you to just find a place and, and pray and just talk to God. Ask Him to help you. Ask Him to give you strength when you're weak. I want to change the order of the service very quickly. And perhaps you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God. We always ask this. We'll never close the service without asking. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, 